Okay, so we'll just get started right on time because we tend to have a lot of content. And um, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe G. Suzuki. I'm an addiction psychiatrist here at Brigham Women's Hospital, serving as the director for the Division of Addiction Psychiatry, also, as well as a program director for our Brigham Addiction Medicine Fellowship Program. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome everybody to the final session in the series on opioid use disorder around the globe uh, speaker series uh, sponsored by the Program in Opioid and Pain Innovation or Poppy, and the Harvard Medical School Center for Global Health Delivery. Um, we really had a wonderful series of speakers these past um, several weeks here from, uh, we had US, Canada, Malaysia, Vietnam, UAE, Germany, and Australia. And it's clear that the opioid crisis has really impacted every corner of the world. Uh, although with some variation in how the crisis has evolved and, and listening to all the speakers, it's clear that the approach to this crisis is also varied tr tremendously with different countries having to find their own solutions um, uh, that fit their particular setting uh, and needs. Clearly, one size does not fit all. Um, and so just as there has been a tremendous difference between US and Canada, even though we're not right next to each other, I've certainly appreciate the opportunity to learn from the different experiences. And I'm very confident that today's speakers will uh, also provide us with even more to think about. Um, as such, I'm very honored to introduce the two speakers we have for our final session today who will describe the experience from Portugal, as well as South Africa. So our first speaker is uh, Steve Rolls, uh, who is a senior policy analyst for Transform Drug Policy Foundation, uh, a UK-based charity focused on drug policy and law reform analysis and advocacy, where he has worked for 20 years. Uh, Steve has been a regular contributor to the public debate on drug policy and law in the media, uh, at UK and international events in various UN and government forums, and has been published in The Lancet, the BMJ Addiction and the International Journal of Drug Policy. Um, Steve has served as an advisor for the Uruguayan, Canadian and Luxembourg governments on cannabis regulation and was a lead drafter and technical coordinator for two reports for the Global Commission on Drug Policy. Um, Steve was also a contributing editor to the Transform Drug Policy Foundation's case study report, Drug Recriminalization in Portugal, uh, setting the record straight, uh, which marked the 20 year anniversary of Portugal's ground banking reform. So hopefully we'll hear more, more about this. Our second speaker is Michael Wilson, who is the Executive Director of Advanced Access and Delivery, or AAND, South Africa, and the Global Harm Reduction Lead for AAND. He is the co-founder and director of the Bellhaven Harm Reduction Center in Durban, South Africa, uh, which is South Africa's first comprehensive harm reduction center. Uh, Michael also works to establish and support existing partnerships across AAND's global TB harm reduction and refugee health projects and activities. In his current role, Michael is supporting the rollout of service delivery grant to uh, integrate screening and linkage to care for TB and non-communicable diseases in Durban, uh, South Africa. Um, so we have some uh, uh, tremendous amount of expertise here. So we'll start with Steve and then we'll continue with Michael following that. So uh, Steve, uh, please take it away. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to, to join you today. Um, I've got quite a lot to, to, to plow through, so I'm just going to get stuck straight in and I'm going to try and share my screen and see if this works. Um, hopefully that's working. Um, so uh, I've called my, my talk uh, Opioid Policy, History, Trends and um, Innovations. And uh, I'm going to talk firstly a little bit about the UK situation, um, and then I'm going to move on to um, some, some of the innovations around the world focusing on Portugal. Um, in terms of the in terms of uh, opioid policy in the UK, um, it's, it goes back a long way historically. Uh, the first controls were in 1868 um, under the, the the Pharmacy Act, which was basically just registering sales. We then had uh, the 1908 Pharmacy Act, where it, uh, opium was uh, controlled as a poison. The first international international controls were in 1912, um, the Hague, Hague Opium Convention. And that convention then translated into UK law in 1920 in the Dangerous Drugs Act, which established, a, which sort of pioneered the narrative of drugs as a threat um, that required a punitive criminal justice uh, response. But within that punitive model that was emerging at that time, there was a, a report came from the uh, Rolleston Committee, um, which interestingly formalized the practice of doctors prescribing morphine and heroin to people with addictions. Um, in, particularly, in particular, um, soldiers who had uh, veterans with war injuries from the First World War. So we, this medical approach within a penal framework became known internationally um, as the British system. 
Um, nothing much happened of interest. I mean, use continued from the, the 1920s onwards at a fairly low level until around the 1960s. And the 1960s was also obviously a, a profound moment of change in drug policy and drug patterns of drug use globally. We had the 1961 UN Single Convention on Drugs, which the US was obviously very involved in, um, which formalized the punitive enforcement model as a kind of global uh, policy paradigm. Um, before the 1960s, heroin use was <clears throat> fairly limited to uh, over 30s, middle class users and uh, veterans. Um, but in the 1960s, use started to grow and diversify into other demographics and groups. There was obviously a lot happening politically and culturally and economically and socially in the 1960s. Um, and during that time, political concerns around heroin started to grow in conjunction with the growing uh, sort of concerns with drug use um, more broadly as drug use began to expand more broadly as well as part of the youth counterculture movement and so on. Um, with heroin specifically, there was growing concerns around overprescribing. There was a few corrupt doctors. Um, there was some leakage of heroin supplies um, into the uh, illegal market. And the British system by the end of the 60s was uh, for political reasons, essentially, it wasn't so much evidence based, was heavily restricted um, at the end of the 60s and, and 70s. So we went from about 5000 people who were getting heroin prescriptions down to a few hundred. And then in 1971, we had our contemporary legislation, which is still with us today, the UK Misuse of Drugs Act. And we also saw it sort of mirroring what was happening in the UK. Uh, Richard Nixon launched his war on drugs in uh, the US. And it's interestingly, last month was the 50th anniversary of that moment. And it's the 50th anniversary of the Misuse of Drugs Act as well. Just as a reminder, um, I appreciate heroin is a schedule one drug in the US and it's, it's completely illegal even for medical use. In the UK, uh, on the left here, you can see uh, heroin was available in pharmacies up until the early 1900s, as I mentioned. Um, it's still available as a, a prescribable drug in uh, ampule form up the top. This here is uh, diafin, diafin, which is a, a Swiss heroin product used in uh, heroin assisted treatments. This is in pill form and injectable liquids. And over on the right here, if you needed uh, evidence that heroin's harms are very much context specific, this is IND nasal spray, which is a heroin nasal spray for pediatric use for uh, three to five year olds. And it's, you know, heroin is a very effective uh, drug if it's used sensibly in uh, medically controlled environments. Um, in terms of what happened since 1971, this graph, uh, which is uh, from, our, from the UK Home Office, captures it, I think, rather well. Um, <clears throat> you can see that uh, the, the, the three lines represent uh, new users, uh, heroin seizures is dark blue and opioid overdose deaths is uh, light green. Um, the, the things sort of ticked up gently during the 70s, but then in the 80s and 90s, we had this incredible rapid acceleration uh, in heroin use and heroin related uh, mortality. Um, <clears throat> and so from uh, less than 10,000 users in the late 70s, in the early 70s, through this rapid rise in the 80s and 90s, we had over a quarter of a million users by the early 2000s. So a more than 20 or 25 fold increase over that, um, over that period. Um, some positive things happened, despite the horrible statistics. During the 1980s, um, just as heroin use was rising, we also had the HIV crisis emerge. Um, and the, the combined crises actually led to quite rapid innovation um, in terms of harm reduction, targeting this growing population of people injecting drugs. So this was under Margaret Thatcher, who obviously had no love for uh, people who inject drugs and certainly no love for men who have sex with men. But because of the greater crisis of HIV, they actually did direct significant resources into harm reduction in terms of condom programs and safe sex programs and harm reduction for uh, people who inject drugs. And the UK, sort of surprisingly for some, was actually one of the pioneering uh, countries in terms of things like methadone prescribing and needle syringe programs um, during that period. And a lot of that uh, work has subsequently spread around the world as best practice globally. As a result of getting in there fairly early, 
the UK has a relatively uh, low level of bloodborne viruses, uh, hepatitis and HIV amongst people who use drugs, certainly relative to countries who either came late or have not still not put in harm reduction programs, places like Russia. Um, <clears throat> Uh, another interesting observation is that heroin and crack markets, when crack finally arrived later, it came late in the uh, UK heroin epidemic. Um, it had obviously been a problem in the 80s in the US, but it didn't really arrive in the UK until the late 90s. Crack very much penetrated um, the same supply networks and the same using populations as heroin. And there's a big overlap in the UK between heroin and crack use, um, about an 80% overlap if you were going to draw a Venn diagram. Um, another interesting observation is that there, there was quite a lot of investment, somewhat echoing the 80s response to the HIV crisis, there was a lot of investment in treatment and harm reduction in the 2000s under Tony Blair, um, but it was very much part of, the, of a crime reduction agenda. Again, there was no particular compassion or public health uh, motivation to help people who, who inject drugs. But in the same way as they were rejecting the HIV crisis, this was very much about um, addressing the uh, crime related crisis that was in the UK at the time, because obviously, oh, unsurprisingly, a lot of people who inject drugs were also committing large volumes of uh, petty crime to support their use. So where are we today? We still have very high levels of uh, opioid use, uh, both historically and in terms of um, comparable countries around Europe. There's been a marginal decrease in recent years in line with EU trends, but even whilst use of heroin has been going down marginally, we've had this alarming rise in, in opioid related deaths in recent years, particularly since about 2012. The reasons for this are quite hard to pin down. Some people have argued that it's a vulnerable population. Um, it's mostly older users who are dying, who may have multiple vulnerabilities, uh, health vulnerabilities sort of acquired over a number of decades. Um, but I think probably it's more to do with increasing polydrug use, uh, particularly stimulants, cocaine and uh, benzodiazepines. And I'll just come on to that in terms of the uh, example of Scotland. Um, but just also to note that fentanyl, which I know has been a big driver of rising mortality rates in the US and Canada, um, is very low prevalence in the UK. And it's not really a feature of our um, opioid patterns of use at all. It's not completely absent, but it's really not a big, big thing here yet. Yet. Um, this, these graphs are uh, of uh, opioid related deaths in the UK. The bottom one is uh, methadone, the middle one is heroin, and the top one is the combined thing. So you can see use ticking up um, through the 90s, kind of plateauing out in the early 2000s, and then this horrifying uh, rise since around 2012, uh, which we are still um, experiencing. Um, it's been particularly bad in Scotland. I just want to focus on Scotland briefly. Um, this is the, the graph at the top, you can see rise from 244 uh, drug related deaths to 120, uh, 1264, um, 20, years, 20 years or so later, um, most of which were opioid related, but not all of them. And this graph down at the bottom, it shows how the rise in deaths is very much concentrated around uh, older, older users, 35 to 44 year olds and 45 to 54 year olds with just absolutely terrifying spike in, in use over the 20 year period. Um, just to show how bad Scotland is in the European context, um, this is all the European countries here. The UK here is nearly the highest uh, country in U Europe, if you with this Scotland included, um, only Sweden has a higher drug related death rate. But Scotland here is like four or five times higher than anywhere else. So just dramatically worse than anywhere in Europe by, by just by a ridiculously big margin. Um, you can see here that the, a lot of that use is driven by uh, rising deaths related to heroin and methadone. Um, I don't know how many methadone related deaths there are in the US, but um, most of the, the, the people using methadone who are dying, it's methadone related. So they are almost all polydrug deaths. Um, a lot of methadone is diverted, but a lot of people also mix prescribed methadone with other drugs. Um, I think this is, uh, this, this is a particularly important thing to note here, is an awful lot of the rising deaths in Scotland are related to benzodiazepine use and to a, to a lesser extent gabapentinoids. Um, you can see pretty much tracking the heroin from around 2014, there's this terrifying spike in benzodiazepine related deaths. 
um, particularly atizolam, which is a, um, a, a, I don't know if it's a prescribed drug, but large volumes of it, uh, atizolam are coming in from China. You can buy, buy them incredibly cheap. They're like less than a dollar a pill. They're incredibly strong. They last a long time. They're very much meeting similar need in terms of escape or drugs of despair um, that opioid use has done historically, but they are very, very dangerous because they are used, if they're used with alcohol or with opioids, you get this combination of central nervous system depressants um, and a very, very high acute mortality risk. You can also see down the bottom slightly less uh, big numbers, but still pretty terrifying, massive rise in cocaine related deaths. Um, this is thought to relate specifically to the, the rise in purity and drop in price of heroin. So a lot more, uh, sorry, cocaine, a lot more cocaine injecting is going on and a lot more people are using cocaine and heroin together and with other drugs as well. So we've got this cumulative thing. It's not all opioids. A lot of it is to do with stimulants. I know that overlaps with the US, but I don't think the US has anything like this uh, benzodiazepine issue that, we, that Scotland has. But it's something you really do need to keep an eye on. Uh, because it could easily be a problem. These are cheap, very effective from a user point of view drugs, um, and they could easily penetrate the market at any time. In terms of responses, um, there's been some really bad things have happened. There's, at the same time as these deaths have been rising up, we've seen uh, cuts in funding to drug services of around 25% in the last five years, which is obviously a total disaster. Um, we've also seen a sort of abstinence, ideological abstinence and recovery focus from the government and a sort of ideological hostility to harm reduction, um, which has obviously not been very helpful. But there have been some positive local innovations that are worth uh, noting. We've seen some localized decriminalization approaches. Uh, they're called diversion, but to all intents and purposes, it's decriminalization because if you're arrested in possession, you get pushed towards a health intervention uh, rather than um, a criminal justice intervention. It's a bit like drug courts, but without the court. So the police, it goes pre-arrest rather than post-arrest. Um, we've seen supervised drug consumption facilities, a vigorous debate on that, but we have yet to have any open. The government, as part of this host ideological hostility, are not, allow not allowing any supervised drug consumption facilities to open, but there's a couple of underground, under the radar ones are opening. A big expansion in naloxone provision, um, we've seen a bit of a return to the British system uh, with a few heroin assisted treatment clinics opening up, but adopting the more Swiss model. Not So you don't just get your heroin on prescription, you actually go into a clinical setting and you use uh, under supervision and then uh, you, you kind of go in there twice a day. Um, and that's, a ve that's very expensive, but it's very uh, cost. It's been shown to be very cost effective. We're also seeing a bit more of the sort of safe supply debate that's been going on in uh, Canada around uh, benzo prescribing to deal with the, the benzo issue in Scotland and the beginnings of a discussion on stimulant prescribing, although obviously the, the treatment modalities there aren't nearly as well developed as they are for opioids. We've also seen some uh, pioneering uh, drug checking services uh, in city centres where people can bring their drugs and have them checked for uh, content and purity. Um, in terms of Portugal, very, very quickly, because I appreciate I haven't got very much uh, longer, um, Portugal has become a big focus of uh, a lot of attention and we've produced this briefing which you can get on the Transform uh, website, so I'm, I'm just going to quickly whiz through it. Um, it's not the only place that's decriminalised uh, personal use of drugs, but it's the one that's had the most attention, I think probably because it did it, you know, did it well. Uh, Spain and Italy have also done it and a number of other European countries did it and some of them did it before Portugal, but they haven't received the same amount of attention. And I think the reason was because Portugal didn't just decriminalize personal possession use, um, it was also part of a much wider reorientation of policy towards a health led approach. Um, the law change was seen as a critical enabler of a health based approach supported, and this is crucial, by investment in treatment and harm reduction. So they actually moved resources from criminal justice to health. It wasn't just a, a rhetorical um, reorientation. And the outcomes on most key metrics have been very positive, as has been quite prominently um, explored. Um, and I think significantly, despite initial hostility, it has very broad political and public support in Portugal, basically because it's been a success, shows the value of uh, leadership. Um, this is a drug. This is a, a graph of uh, drug related deaths in Portugal from the, the decriminalization is uh, from, from here is the first one. You can see that the deaths dropped rapidly in the first decade 
and they've tra they've tacked up slightly since 2010, um, but are still well, well below uh, European averages. All this is in the briefing, by the way, if you want to look at it in more detail. Um, here you can see how the prison population um, percentages uh, who are drug related offenders has dropped dramatically in Portugal. Um, here you can see Portugal's level of use is right down here at the lower end of the European um, averages, even though they've decriminalized. Um, and finally, and perhaps most impressively of all, you can see uh, HIV diagnoses amongst people who inject drugs um, has dropped from that, you know, 40% of uh, the, the EU total down to virtually zero. So it's been a, on, on most metrics, I think it's been regarded as a great success. Um, finally, um, decriminalization, it is actually supported by all UN agencies. Um, that there, is a, there was a UN common position on drugs published in 2019 that included the World Health Organization, UN Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, UNICEF, all of the UN agencies that called unambiguously for member states to decriminalize people who use drugs. So it's not really a, a marginal or um, uh, sort of fringe call anymore. The, the UN is a pretty conservative entity and they have, they have unambiguously backed it uh, across the board. Um, we also have the leading UK medical authorities like the Royal College of Physicians and the Royal Society of Public Health have also called for decriminalization. Um, clearly it reduces obstacles to services and frees up resources. I think the Portugal example shows that very well. Um, it has to be a lot more than just uh, changing the law. You need to have a, a, a range of holistic support put in place to deal with the people who are then directed into services. And that has to include things like housing, very much an advocate of housing first approaches, employment support, mental health, and so on. There are some difficult technical questions that need to be answered with decriminalization. What would the thresholds be between personal use and supply, for example? Um, should we have any non-criminal sanctions at all? We, we certainly argue that there shouldn't be any sanctions of any kind for possession, um, but, uh, but that has not generally happened where countries have done it. Um, I think involvement of people who use drugs in policy design is absolutely critical. And finally, I think expungement of past criminal records is a, a vital part of any decriminalization approach. If we're, if we're trying to address the stigma of criminal records going forward, we also need to do that, do so um, historically. And my final comment is that reform doesn't just stop at decriminalization. Um, many harms are driven by uh, illegal supply of drugs, prohibition and illegal markets. And there needs to be a wider debate on regulated markets and safe supply of all drugs, not just cannabis. Um, Transform has been very much engaged in this debate. So you can go and download all our reports and books and stuff uh, from our website if you're interested in it. You don't have to pay for any of them. They're all free uh, downloads um, and I'm obviously be very interested to hear what anyone thinks of that. Thanks very much. Sorry, that's been a bit of a whistle stop tour with far too many slides. And I will stop sharing the screen. Great, thank you so much, Steve. So we'll, we'll move right on to um, Michael Wilson speaking about South Africa. So Michael, if you can take over. Great, okay, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Yes, looks good. Okay, great. All right, thanks so much. Um, so uh, I'm really honored to be uh, a part of this, this series. Um, as was mentioned, I'm the co-founder of an organization called Advanced Access and Delivery. Um, and I'm based in Durban, South Africa. Uh, most of my talk today will focus on opioid use amongst the homeless and low income uh, individuals in, in Durban, where I'm uh, the director of South Africa's first comprehensive harm reduction center, uh, which was actually established during lockdown and uh, has now been running for 14 months. Uh, so just a brief overview, I'll, I'll give um, a little bit of context about drug use in South Africa and a bit of history of harm reduction programs. Uh, also discuss some of the policy landscape around the protection of rights um, and the provision of services for people who use drugs. Uh, and I would like to spend the bulk of the presentation to show how one city responded, uh, in particular to the, the needs of people who use drugs during uh, COVID-19 lockdown uh, levels four and five and how that response has been sustained. 
Um, so uh, I won't go in quite as much detail as, as Steve, but uh, just in terms of heroin production globally um, has, has really been on the rise, um, particularly in the last two decades. Um, in South Africa, we have seen an increase of drug trafficking uh, to the region and an increase in the local market. Um, it really, heroin really only came on the scene here, particularly in the Western Cape uh, in the early 90s. And um, there was uh, only reports of heroin being injected uh, in the early 2000s. Um, it's estimated in South Africa that uh, at the moment, approximately 20% of heroin users are uh, injectors. Um, and as you can see uh, here, Durban uh, sits on the, on the Eastern coast of South Africa. And our hub is a, is a major uh, transport hub for the entire region. Um, and so every single day there is a lot of heroin uh, that does come in and out of our port. Um, just in terms of uh, HIV and hepatitis uh, and, and tuberculosis, um, we know that amongst people who inject drugs, um, and this only being, as I, as I mentioned, about 20% of the total uh, population of people who use here in the country, um, that there are very high rates of uh, hepatitis C and HIV. A study that was led uh, in 2017 and 2018 by a colleague of mine, Dr. Andrew Scheibe, found that of the total uh, 941 uh, people who inject that were uh, tested, 45% uh, of them tested positive for hepatitis C and 21% tested positive for HIV. And this was across uh, three major cities, Cape Town, Durban, and Pretoria. Um, there's no current uh, empiric data on the TB burden amongst people who use drugs, but uh, based on program data um, and what information we do have um, on TB rates amongst homeless individuals in South Africa, um, it's likely that uh, the rates are uh, above 20%. To date, uh, there remains very limited uh, harm reduction specific services across the country that meet the needs uh, of people who use drugs. Um, if we look at the data for, uh, of programs that specifically target people who inject drugs, um, we can see that there, there is very low capacity at the moment uh, with the current programs that target uh, the health and the psychosocial needs of people who use. Um, in addition to the the very high rates of, uh, of hepatitis C, HIV, and TB amongst people who use drugs. We also know that overdoses are occurring. Um, we don't at the moment uh, have a reported um, fentanyl at the moment, uh, at least not it, it's not widespread, uh, but we did a small study back in 2018 uh, interviewing uh, 66 individuals across three cities to ask them about their personal experience um, with a drug overdose. And these were uh, people who inject drugs. And we found that 63% uh, of them reported that they had experienced a drug overdose sometime in the last year. Um, and then we asked them uh, how many of them had a, had a peer or knew somebody who had experienced a drug overdose. And 76% uh, 76 report, 76 reported that they knew at least one person who had experienced a drug overdose in the last year. Uh, politically, the conversations um, to include principles of harm reduction in the National Drug Master Plan uh, were really initiated uh, in, in 2011 when, when a new plan was being drafted. Um, but because of some harsh objection and backlash, uh, particularly to the provision of uh, clean needles and syringes for people who inject, uh, harm reduction has largely been left out of uh, national health and um, social development strategies and master plans. Uh, the new plan, which was supposed to be released, uh, new national drug master plan, which was planned to be released in 2017, uh, was only released in 2019, but it, 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 it um, seems to be very promising. Um, it includes uh, some very progressive language, particularly um, some outcome measures that include the number of people um, that are enrolled in needle and syringe programs across the country, uh, the number of people who have been retained um, by an opioid substitution therapy program. And I think that uh, politically there, there seems to be some very positive steps towards um, broadening the inclusion of uh, harm reduction principles into national strategies, um, including the consideration of methadone uh, on, to be included on the essential medicines list for OST maintenance at, uh, at the primary care level. 
um, which we, we hope will help dramatically in reducing the current price of methadone. Um, at the moment, uh, methadone in South Africa costs 23 times the global average and over 60 times uh, what global fund programs in Kenya and Ukraine, just as two examples, um, are paying. Well, there has been a lot of political progress uh, to protect the rights of people who use drugs and to provide dedicated funds to programs um, that do demonstrate impact. The programs that are largely funded by the government uh, continue to remain abstinence-based. And those that do offer opioid substitution therapy, um, most of them are limited to a three months maximum. Uh, drug treatment programs across the country continue to report very low retention rates, as you can see by uh, this graph, and are largely stimulant based, although um, some have been recently including heroin. Um, just in the last three years, though, we have seen a couple of examples of community-based community treatment programs, um, largely that have been a collaboration with uh, universities, NPOs, and uh, the government, uh, two in particular, one in the city of Chuane, and the other an opioid substitution therapy demonstration project in Durban that have generated really good evidence um, that have been able to retain very high rates of individuals in the programs, shown uh, reductions in heroin use and, um, and some improvements in, uh, in quality of life indicators. Um, with this, I would like to just pivot to uh, share the experience uh, that we have had uh, here in Durban. Um, so the Human uh, Sciences Research Council uh, did a study back in 2016 to, to count the number of um, people that are living on the streets in Durban and found approximately between shelters and people living on the streets, um, about 4,000 people, um, of which 60% of them de self-declared that they um, have a substance use problem. Uh, the city's response prior uh, to lockdown um, really, uh, the, the environment really around issues relating to the needs of people who use drugs was very much linked uh, with a prohibitionist stance. Um, and just a couple of examples, one is, uh, was the city's closure of the only needle and syringe uh, program, needle and syringe uh, exchange program uh, that was closed for 18 months. Um, an increasing number of reports uh, from the homeless of human rights violations by police and generally um, just a, a, a known to be slow to respond to the needs um, of people who are living on the streets. Um, but in, in 2019, in October of 2019, uh, there was a deputy mayor appointed uh, Belinda Scott who set up a homeless task team that was made up of representatives from local NPOs, uh, police, both the Metro Police and the SAPS, South African uh, Police Services, uh, representatives from the local university, as well as uh, parks and recreation, and um, even to the point where uh, the, the deputy mayor hosted a group uh, from the lead National Support Bureau, Bureau in Seattle, uh, came to uh, Durban in February of 2019 to talk about uh, diversion and how law enforcement could act as uh, protectors of harm reduction programs um, and to learn from other cities. Um, so it was really from this platform uh, that we were able to immediately mobilize a program that was able to protect uh, and uphold the rights of, of homeless individuals and people who use drugs during lockdown. Um, so as a country, South Africa entered into a national lockdown on the 27th of March, uh, 2020. Um, at, at, the, at the time, we had 2,200 homeless people that uh, came through a central um, system which then uh, assigned them to one of 12 uh, temporary safe, safe sleeping spaces that was, um, that, uh, was organized and, and run by the city itself. Uh, the existing homeless task team that had been uh, pre-established uh, came together to, uh, to ensure that a feeding, uh, that um, showers and ablution facilities and that medical care was provided um, and that clinical supervision uh, was, was uh, provided at all of these sites. Um, we very quickly realized that uh, we, we had a pretty serious problem on our hands uh, with a, around 40 to 50% of those who were staying in the shelters 
uh, began very quickly to experience uh, moderate to severe symptoms of drug withdrawal, um, and which was very uh, quite traumatic uh, for many. Um, and so the, um, the city uh, came together uh, recognizing that um, that this group of individuals leaving the, the sites was really comprom compromising the security, uh, the integrity of the sites as, as COVID free. Um, and because people were escaping to purchase um, a, a really kind of already dwindling and expensive drug supply uh, on the streets, um, that it was really adding to uh, the cost and to um, the headache of, of many to keep the sites um, safe. And so the city uh, called together a small group to run a private medical uh, with dr drug withdrawal program on two of the sites. Um, and so a team um, was capacitated to uh, do clinical opioid withdrawal uh, assessments at all 12 of the sites, and then to move those who wanted to be on uh, a methadone program to two of the sites. Um, symptomatic uh, packs were put together. We call them Wunga packs. Um, heroin here in South Africa is often known as uh, Niwope, uh, Wunga, uh, or sugars. Uh, it's all really the same, uh, but we did put together symptom packs for those that wanted um, symptomatic relief. Um, and then those who wanted to be on the, the methadone program were moved to two sites where we ran a, uh, a, a methadone and uh, a methadone program uh, for seven days a week at these two sites. Um, during these eight weeks, um, we were also able to provide um, comprehensive uh, medical care uh, as we, as every single site had a full team uh, of nurses on site. Um, seven days a week. Uh, we were able to uh, x-ray uh, over 1,100 individuals uh, across the 12 sites for tuberculosis. Uh, we were able to reinitiate many uh, people on TB medicines and ARVs um, and uh, also offer psychiatric treatment and referrals on site as we had a, a full team um, that was on call and, and available to assist. Just in terms of uh, the, the opportunity, um, the lockdown in the city's response, um, I think showed a, a couple of uh, very important things. Uh, one being the value of a very proactive government, uh, local government in conceptualizing safe sleeping spaces and setting up the committee. Um, this was something that had been done prior to lockdown. Um, and it really uh, allowed for a multidisciplinary response to a very complex a set of issues um, that needed an urgent response. Uh, I think those of us who have been were working uh, in Durban found that uh, COVID really fast tracked many political processes that had been stalled for many months and many years, um, sped up uh, procurement, uh, reopened the needle and syringe exchange program that had been closed for 18 months. It was actually reopened uh, and reinstated uh, during lockdown, and it also brought together. Uh, public safety and public health officials, NGOs uh, to the same table to talk about the needs of uh, the homeless and needs of people who use drugs. And I think maybe most importantly, um, what we feel like COVID did was it provided a platform to showcase um, evidence-based harm reduction interventions um, using a combination of uh, university, uh, private sector, public, uh, public sector implementers, um, and protectors of the program. And I mean, I think those of us that were involved in this program know that it was a very imperfect program, uh, but it really was an opportunity to raise awareness and uh, deepen understanding, uh, not only of the needs of people who use drugs, but also of harm reduction approaches um, and their impact. And uh, in this case, in a very uh, short period of time. So just moving ahead, um, South Africa entered into uh, level three of lockdown in uh, on June 1st uh, of last year. And at that time, uh, the city council made a decision to give uh, our group a community hall that was owned by the city for the continued running of uh, this program. And uh, this became South Africa's first comprehensive uh, harm reduction center um, that really represents uh, what we think is a very unique partnership between the NGOs that implement uh, from the center, the local university, uh, and the city. Um, to date, the city has invested 800,000 Rand into 
making the building fit for purpose. Uh, it's also provided to us uh, rates free um, and the harm reduction center is uh, open um, and operational seven days a week. Um, the services offered um, are a daily observed methadone provision. Um, our ceiling at the moment, it's, it's low, uh, but it was originally initially put in place um, because of funding constraints. Um, it is, it's 15 mils, uh, but we find that probably 60 to 70% of uh, the, the 180 to 200 who come through on a daily basis are coping very well. Um, and we've also had very high retention rates. Um, and we believe that uh, we are likely breaking the transition um, that many uh, often have from smoking to injecting, um, or at least uh, having some, some impact on that. Uh, there's also the needle and syringe program uh, that is provided two days a week from the center. Uh, we have testing and referral provision of medication for uh, TB and HIV. Uh, we have an accompaniment program, this middle picture here, uh, we have a peer um, who visits uh, individuals who are on uh, TB medicines or um, ARVs and delivers them uh, to them where they're staying if they're unable to come into the center. Um, we also uh, have uh, women-focused services. Uh, we've had a Women's Health Day um, where we've had testing and treatment for STIs. Um, the, the, the really crux of our program is uh, to be as low threshold um, with almost no barriers to access. Um, and we have been now operational for uh, the last 14 months. Um, just a note, we have uh, received uh, rec some, some great recognition for the harm reduction center just in the last, um, in the last year, which has been wonderful. Um, I think that uh, the, the important note of this uh, for, for us is that even amidst COVID and a very imperfect program, um, that there, there is recognition, um, one from the African, the South African Cities Network, um, which profiles um, good stories uh, from various cities um, every year. And we were selected as the good hood story um, for last year uh, for Durban. Uh, it's also, we also uh, received the HSRC and the Universities of South Africa 2020 Team Award for Excellence in the Humanities and Social Science for responding to COVID. And I think what this really speaks to is our team's commitment uh, to the highest ethical standards and the ability to do this um, even amongst COVID. Um, just in terms of continued support from the government, as I mentioned, uh, the building has been provided uh, rates free. Um, there has been investment uh, into the upkeep and the maintenance of the building. We have static security. Um, this is all provided uh, by the city. Um, there's also been a tremendous support from the Department of Social Development as we are in kind of the lengthy process of registering it as a community-based uh, treatment center. Um, and just lastly, the collaboration with the police um, as protectors of, the serv of, ser of our services. Um, we've actually been now receiving referrals um, rather than arrest um, to our center. Um, and we this is just a photo of us uh, doing a uh, an overdose uh, training with members of uh, Metro Police um, earlier this year. So just in terms of uh, some of the lessons learned, I think um, this was a paper that we wrote um, at the end of last year around police as, as advocates of harm reduction. We actually interviewed um, several members of uh, law enforcement who were involved in protecting the lockdown sites and um, wrote about uh, the, how their views uh, shifted uh, just in a short period of time through interactions with people who use drugs um, in their role there um, at the two sites that we were running our medical withdrawal program from. Um, this is just a final slide, um, just to emphasize uh, that at the moment, uh, we have between 180 and 200 clients per day um, coming through the center. Uh, it's really, there's really an emphasis on meeting individuals where they are um, and being as, as flexible as we possibly can. Um, during Ramadan, we had uh, about 30 individuals who were, um, who were uh, 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 recognizing Ramadan and we were able to be flexible in terms of uh, offering their doses uh, in the evening and being open and having a team that was there um, after their iftar prayers 
uh, to, to take their methadone and to serve them a meal. Uh, we've also had many community forums, including with family members to talk about drugs and to talk about harm reduction. Uh, we had an overdose a vigil back in October uh, in recognition of overdose, a World Overdose uh, Awareness Day. Um, and we've really uh, recently begun to engage uh, local businesses, both in conversations around uh, the sustainability of our programs, but also in offering skills development um, to uh, many of our clients. And this middle photo is a, a, a partnership that has recently been established with a, uh, a, a manufacturer company called Lifestyle Republic that accepted um, 10 of our uh, clients, uh, five males and five females, um, that just went through a, a three-month uh, training initiative where they learned printmaking, but also uh, business development and, and uh, quite a bit of skills training. So I think um, I would just like to end there and just um, say that I think that for, for those of us that have been working in the space, uh, the harm reduction space in Durban, um, COVID I think has really presented a tremendous opportunity uh, to showcase the highest standards of care and support uh, for people who use drugs. Um, and we have felt very fortunate to have received a lot of uh, political support and financial backing um, from local businesses, uh, which I think is really unique uh, to sustain um, our program. So thanks so much for this opportunity. Wow, that, that was really terrific, both speakers. <clears throat> um, just as Sue is mentioning, please enter your questions in the Q&A function uh, or the chat, uh, or um, we can call on folks to ask questions directly as well. So, so again, thank you so much. This is very illuminating. So one thing that really struck me immediately was this idea that COVID was a catalyst for positive change. Um, here in the US, between June of 2019 into the first half of COVID, the U.S. saw 80,000 deaths, which is the highest number of deaths from overdose-related, you know, uh, things, in a 12-month period ever recorded in the history of this country. Um, we saw a reversing of the trends around over the, overdose deaths, uh, increase in alcohol use. I mean, all kinds of things, um, you know, went in the wrong direction. Even though many, you know, many restrictions and policies changes were implemented to try to, you know, uh, increase access to care, et cetera. So I'm just curious, you know, Michael, what really allowed in South Africa that actually, you know, this became a catalyst for positive change? I'm curious to hear from Steve if, you know, what what the situation was in the UK or in Portugal with whether COVID had a had a positive impact or a negative impact. In the US, it seemed like both, but in terms of overdose deaths, it's been largely negative, disproportionately affecting black and brown communities. I'm, I mean, in the UK, there were certainly some positive trends. Um, there, there, one, one of the positive things that happened that was quite surprising from this government was that they essentially um, committed to ending street homelessness and basically did it almost overnight. They, they made hotels available, residences, they poured 800 million pounds into a program for a year to basically get everybody off the streets because they were so worried that this was going to be a major vector um, transmission risk for COVID. Turns out that it actually wasn't particularly, and our homeless population has not been nearly as badly hit by COVID as a lot of people imagine they would be. But the upside of it was that we did get a lot of people into uh, accommodation of various forms. And through that, um, there was both an evolution of how drug using people in government supported housing was managed because you can't really have a zero tolerance approach to that. You have to have a managed approach. So that was that, that there was that was quite an interesting evolution of people's thinking because you, if you wanted to get people off the streets and they weren't going to stop using drugs, you just had to deal with it. Um, and the other thing was that it ena enabled a lot more access to services. So there's been massive increase in demand on services, which has been a problem because obviously there wasn't any more money for those services. Um, and I guess the other thing that was positive that's happened is that um, for methadone, uh, to a large extent, almost everyone went from daily pickups uh, and supervised consumption of methadone to weekly or, or fortnightly pickups, um, which from a user perspective, and I think generally from a prescriber perspective, was seen as um, significantly preferable. In terms of impacts on death rate, uh, mortality rates, um, I don't think we've seen any particular change in the trends, but I, I haven't. There hasn't been close scrutiny of uh, recent data 
yeah, because unfortunately there's this kind of year-long lag. So the last year's data only went up to halfway through last year. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think um, I would just say from from our side, um, you know, I think that what COVID allowed, and and I've heard, you know, obviously been in, in touch with colleagues from around South Africa and their experiences in Cape Town, and I was in Cape Town last week with our colleagues. Um, TB HIV care and the South African network of people use drugs. And I think what we, we all kind of agree with is that it really uh, provided an, an increased visibility to very important uh, city officials and uh, members of the police, um, you know, uh, of what is harm reduction. And, and you know, I think it's, it's there, it, it has largely been um, here, you know, you know, mostly um, sort of programs have been run by by NPOs and, and in the private sector, but uh, COVID almost forced um, forced us to to kind of come together and for it gave that that opportunity for these programs to both be visualized, uh, but but you know also um, I think the the impact was seen in such a short amount so, such a short period of time. And I think that the other piece that uh, for us here was you know with such a stretched um, healthcare system as it was with COVID. Um, I think things like reinstating the, the needle and syringe program just made a lot of sense at the moment um, because there was this recognition of, well, we have such a stretch system as it is. So we don't have time, you know, to, to do these, you know, to, to, to have meetings to allow, you know, to, to keep this conversation going any further, we have to do something now. Um, so I think only, only this kind of emergency could have done that. Yeah, and, and hopefully those positive changes will persist post COVID. Um, because at this point in the US, many of the emergency declarations have been rescinded. And therefore we're very concerned that some of the positive changes will, will, will reverse despite the fact that our mortality rates have gone up. There is a question in the, in the question box. Mr. Wilson, have you had any clients that didn't manage to get their dosage physically? Were there any online interactions? If yes, what were the challenges? I'm assuming that's about their methadone dosages. Yeah, so um, so there haven't been any online interactions. Um, so from for our program, uh, everyone is coming into our center to get their doses. Um, one thing that we have put in place is we we do have uh, take home doses uh, if somebody has identi can identify um, a, a treatment support person, which is often hard for. Um, you know, for homeless individuals who don't live it live at home, um, then we will uh, we our program will actually be their their support, um, and we will actually take it to them and deliver it in person to the, to the individuals. Uh, but the majority of our uh, program is all done in person. We're not um, you know sort of transacting online. Right. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Uh, a curious pattern has emerged from all the different speakers across the, uh, the world is the, the peculiar, you know, lack of fentanyl in the illicit market. Um, it, at this point in the U.S., for example, in the Northeast region, that is the entirety of the entire illicit opioid supply. Uh, patients who want heroin can't find it. It's simply not available. It is entirely illicit fentanyl. It likely, we, we know it's a major contributor to the dramatic impact recent overdose says. Any thoughts on why fentanyl has not penetrated into your markets? And is that anticipated? I know Steve, you kind of mentioned that it could be coming. Um, I, I think that the, I mean, if you look at the dynamics of the US market and, and the, 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 the evolution of the opioid problems in, in, in the US, I think they have a bit, they're very specific US uh, sort of dynamic in that it began, it began with prescribed opioids and then they were sort of withdrawn and then there was a second wave which was maybe heroin and then then over time the heroin supply has been sort of increasingly displaced or contaminated with fentanyl i think part of that is because uh most of the um heroin supply in the us comes from mexico and south of the border um whereas none of our heroin comes from mexico it all comes from largely from afghanistan um, either by the Balkans or through uh, um, East Africa. And I think the, the particular dynamics of the, the, the illegal market, the, the, I think the Mexican cartels who were providing the opioids, as, as the border tightened up, arguably, or just because of pure economic, the kind of iron law of prohibition, 
if you can smuggle a kilo of fentanyl um, instead of a kilo of heroin and the fentanyl is a hundred times more potent and earns a hundred times more money, but it's the same, you know, why wouldn't you do that? It's, you know, you can drone over a bunch of fentanyl um, and it's it, fentanyl is actually very easy to make. I mean, in, you know, chemistry terms, it's pretty easy to make. The precursors are pretty easily available. Um, it used to be being imported from China, but now it's actually being made in Mexico. And I think the, the Mexican cartels, it's just pure, simple economics. It's just much, much more profitable. Why don't we, it's, it's less legal jeopardy. Let's do that instead. Um, and a, as it's proved an effective marketing strategy and it's proving popular with people who use opioids, I think that's the main driver. I think it's probably market driven. Uh, if someone starts doing that in, in the UK, um, it's a very real possibility. There is a much bigger fentanyl problem in parts of Eastern Europe that have some greater supply access to that. Um, I think it's the economics of an illegal drug market more than anything else. Okay. Hey, thank you. Michael? Yeah. yeah, I'll be honest. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't have a lot of context on, on fentanyl here in South Africa, to be honest. Um, I think that when it has come up, um, we have the the conversation has really um, sort of gone to you know the the fact that we don't have great recording systems for um, for for understanding the, the 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 number of drug overdoses that are occurring um, and good reporting systems. So I think that um, that's something that we're hoping to to be able to set up. Um, we have have been in conversations with the um, with. Um, it's, it's called Sekendu, uh, which, which kind of monitors a lot of the reporting from drug treatment programs across the country. But I think that um, that's definitely something that we're trying to work on and that this study that was done uh, really was uh, meant to be a pilot study to get more, um, yeah, more awareness that overdoses are actually occurring um, and that this, this kind of reporting structure needs to be uh, put in place uh, soon. So yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to find out a little bit more on the fentanyl side. But I mean, I, I would add that, as I mentioned, I think that the issue with benzodiazepines, in many ways, it kind of mirrors the, the fentanyl uh, phenomenon in the US. It's just, it happens to be a different synthetic drug, which has a, a different sort of effect and use profile, but it meets a similar need in many ways. It meets a similar demand in that it's a, you know, it provides that level of escape and uh, sort of relief for people, vulnerable individuals who are sort of escaping from trauma, which tends to be a driver for a large part of the injecting population. Um, and it, it's all similarly, it's very, very cheap. Um, you can buy, you know, literally a handful of these for five pounds or, or 10 bucks. Um, you can buy a single one is less than a dollar, less than, less than a pound in the UK. So yeah, it was fascinating that I saw that in your graph, etizolam and gabapentin always being the highest sort of, you know, uh, co uh, sort of uh, poly substance found in, in, in addition to opioids. Etizolam is pretty minor in the U.S. Gabapentin oils would also be considered fairly minor, uh, even though the, the, the rate of that being misused is actually increasing. Right, um, but I just need to highlight the potential there that those things could explode. You know, say there's a shortage yeah. of fentanyl for some reason, you know, that someone ships in a few tons of etizolam, bang mm, yeah 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 thank you so so i want to be respectful of people's time this actually does bring us to the conclusion of of today and the entire series um so so i want to really thank both uh steve rolls and michael wilson for presenting uh, your respective uh, uh content uh th thank you so much this has been absolutely fascinating i want to pass it on to gloria uh and sue to sort of wrap things up for us here uh this has been absolutely phenomenal so thank you so much Yes, yes, thank you all so much. I'm gonna try to make this really quick um, and to the point, I'm Gloria Brand. I'm the director of the program in Opioid and Pain and Innovation at the Brigham. Um, we've been established in 2019 with high hopes to be a leader and a catalyst for the progression and collaboration and research in this space of a OUD, SUD, chronic pain and all of the common and co-occurring disorders um, with an array of mental health disorders and addictive disorders and other addictive diseases. So we're honored um, to have had, have spearheaded this event 
uh, along with uh, the Harvard Medical School Center for Global Health Care Delivery under the direction of Dr. Salman Kashavi and um, also Dr. Scott Weiner, who's the director of the Brigham Comprehensive Opiate Response and Education um, program at the Brigham um, and the executive director of Poppy. Um, we hope you can stay tuned with Poppy. Visit our website at poppy.bwh.harvard.edu um, for the continued efforts to bring attention to this important um, space of research and healthcare delivery. Um, and a special thanks to Dr. Suzuki, who is the director of the Division of Addiction Psychiatry at Brigham. Again, Dr. Weiner, Dr. Kashavji, and our amazing speakers here today and all, throughout the entire series, Tim Nichols over at the center and Sue Kulkarni, which we're going to like hand it over to right now so she can close us out. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, Gloria. Hi, everyone. I'm Sue, and I'm the program manager for the Harvard Medical School Center for Global Health Del Delivery. Again, I'd like to thank Dr. Suzuki and Gloria. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'd like to join Dr. Suzuki and Gloria in thanking not only today's speakers, but all of you for participating in this webinar series. Um, just as a quick reminder, this is the last of our five sessions exploring models of care for opioid use disorder around the world. All five sessions have been recorded and will be posted on our website. I'll put the URL for our website in the chat as soon as I'm done. And I'll also include our email in case you're interested in being in touch. And finally, um, these events have also been captured in a series of proceedings. These are currently under production and will be published on our website by the end of the summer. Our hope is that these proceedings will increasingly be used by communities and governments to support the strengthening of healthcare delivery systems, particularly for opioid use disorder around the world. And with that, I'd like to thank you all once again for joining our series and invite you to stay in touch with both Poppy and the center in the months to come. So thank you so much all for being here. And with that, we'll say goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye.